You're watching Well Traveled Life with Jonathan and Jennifer, and today we are in Watengi, which is at the very north part of the North Island of New Zealand in the Bay of Islands. Comprised of 144 different islands, this area is known for just its natural beauty. You're going to have tons of coastline and these really special inlets. And there's some really great small towns that dot these islands, and they're, they're considered boutique towns. We're going to talk a little bit about each of those towns. We spent time both in Waitangi and in Paihia, and we're going to talk about both of those, and we're going to talk about the different activities that we can do. Join us. You can drive three hours north of Auckland to get to Bay of Islands, or you can come by boat. We came on a cruise ship. It's a very typical cruise ship destination. It is a tender port, and when you get there, likely you will be arriving in Waitangi. They have a visitor information center right there, and they will have greeters and volunteers who come out to meet the boat. There's a shuttle that will take you from Waitangi to Pahia. Pahia is one of those small boutique towns, and we'll show you what we did while we were there. But you can also grab some shore excursions that either get you out into nature. We went kayaking as well. That's another wonderful activity in the Haruru Falls. And we'll show you that. This might be one of those stops where you really want to dive deep into the culture and history of New Zealand and get a better understanding of what the issues are and how they became that way. We're gonna talk about this in the video because I found that really interesting and wanna share that with you. Directly in walking distance from the Pinder Port in Waitangi, you can walk up a hill and get to the Treaty of Waitangi Museum. This is sacred ground and really is the key to all of this history and culture that I'm talking about. If you take the shuttle into Paihia, they'll do a stop at the treaty grounds and you can stop there and then walk back down the hill to the tender port. You know, we don't always do history and culture in depth, but I really felt like on our last video of New Zealand, we had to touch on probably what's one of the things that came out so boldly to us. There is a tension between the Maori and the Pakeha, and the government has done something to begin to address that. So I wanna talk a little bit about the history today. If you aren't into that and you just wanna see what we did, then go ahead and jump forward and you can see what we did in Watangi and the Bay of Islands. But I hope you'll stick around just for 10 minutes or so and follow along with how this has developed and what New Zealand has done that's really different in the way of merging cultures and healing some of the things that went wrong during colonization. So let's start by talking about some of this history. So you have the first settlers coming to the islands of New Zealand and they were those early Polynesians and they showed up in like the 1320 to 1350 era. They have a very distinct Maori culture and that comes from that Polynesian background but it has developed into really a separate culture than some of the other Polynesians that you see up a little further north in say Tahiti or Hawaii. The first European was Abel Tasman. He got there in 1643 and he went around the west coast of the North Island. He charted it, but he never set foot on the island. Then you've got Captain Cook. He came, he mapped out the entire area and he was there in 1769. Starting in the 18th century, around that time, that's when you started getting regular visits from explorers and missionaries, and other sailors, and some traders and general adventurers. So you have a couple of things going on at the same time. You have got a burgeoning European population coming to New Zealand. There's probably some lawlessness that goes along with that that is hard for the Maori to adjust to. 
But at the same time, they're bringing things that the Maori like. So there's some technology and some skills that they're appreciating. It's also a new trade avenue, which is good for them. That's working out economically. But there are some differences and some things that are probably getting in the way. And because of that, there's a willingness from some Maori to go ahead and begin to work with the British Crown to develop some kind of a negotiation about the rule of New Zealand. At the time, the British Crown was actually ruling New Zealand from Australia. It was part of the New South Wales colony. So you had a ruler in New South Wales that was overseeing all that was happening in New Zealand. The Maori probably didn't appreciate that and were feeling like having a governor in New Zealand would be a better deal for them than having somebody in Australia. I think they were hoping that there would be rule and law for the European settlers. It would be a way to ensure that the settlers that were coming in were under control. The French had created a small settlement just outside of Akaroa and there was some fear that the French were going to have some designs on taking over New Zealand. And there were a number of British missionaries in place in New Zealand and they were certainly arguing and making the case to the Maori that a British rule would be more beneficial to them than a French rule. So I think that probably also played into the thinking of why they would sign a treaty. And again, the missionaries were also sort of peddling this idea that a treaty was a covenant with the British crown. It was a spiritual bond or pact with the queen, Victoria at the time, and, and that had meaning or mana for the Maori. Europeans were being sent over with incentives to colonize and settle in New Zealand. And then you had the gold rush that was bringing over tons of prospectors and people looking for a better way. There was also this very interesting New Zealand company, which was a private enterprise. And Edward Wakefield's plan was to import massive numbers of immigrants who would be laborers for the wealthy investors and would end up making money by being able to buy land with the savings that they made from this work that they were doing. And as you saw this huge population explosion, you had a Maori majority that very quickly lost its ground. All of these population increases we're bringing some additional things that probably weren't benefiting the Maori. So not only were they bringing disease, they were bringing alcohol. The Pakeha, the Europeans that had come to New Zealand, also brought guns and that led to the musket. That didn't lead to the musket wars, but it aided in the killing during the musket wars. The musket wars were the about 3,000 battles fought between 1807 and 1837, and they were intertribal wars. Essentially, they were avenging past defeats using these new arms that they had, and it was like an arms race for the Maori. And by the end, they were just battle weary and had depleted populations to such a degree. And some of the things that they were fighting over weren't even valid fights anymore. But the addition of the muskets helped to make that a more lethal battle than it might otherwise have been. And they were bringing just this disillusionment. These people were losing their land. They were getting swindled and their birth rate started dropping. So you have the English who are fairly young because that's who's coming over to do all of this farming and prospecting. And they're having babies like crazy and their population is growing while the Maori population is diminishing. There seemed to be a need for something to codify benefits for both sides. Kia ora, my name is Joshua Crawford Thompson and I'm a local here in the Bay of Islands in Pine at Waitangi. Now the whenua that we're standing on, the land that we're standing on, was lived by our, our people for a while. Across the way you can see the, um, the marae, which where a lot of, a lot of people gather for different uh, events. Back in 1840, a whole lot of Māori chiefs came to the Bay of Islands and they were discussing the pros and cons of signing a treaty with the British. It lasted for a week and, and a lot of discussions took place because if you know Māori people, they can't make a decision quickly. So they need to weigh up the pros and cons. So on the 6th of February, they all went up to the treaty grounds at Waitangi 
the stuff here and that's where they decided that they would support Te Chiriti or Waitangi and from there it was signed by a number of chiefs and Chief Dinesses and of course Hobson being appointed the governor of the time represented the Queen, Queen Victoria. The Treaty of Waitangi was negotiated and established, not signed by every chief by any means, but signed by enough that it was accepted. Here's where the rub came. You had an English version of this treaty where the Maori give the British crown absolute and without reservation all the rights and powers of sovereignty. But they would be guaranteed an undisturbed possession of their land, forest, fishery, and other properties. So from the beginning, there were differences even in what the goals of the treaty were for. From the British perspective, they were looking to ensure that the Maori interests were protected and their lands were protected, but that British settlement was also protected and that they would have governance and be able to maintain power and peace and order over the new land. In the Maori version, the Maori give the crown Kwanatanga Katoa, this is complete governorship. But they're guaranteed, and this is the important part, Tino Rangatiratanga, the unqualified exercise of chieftainship over their lands, dwelling places, and all other possessions. But from the Maori perspective, what they were wanting was to ensure that their chiefs maintained power over their protected areas and that they would secure their land ownership. Well, that was at conflict a little bit from the beginning, but really where the problem came in is that word sovereignty. There is no such word in the Maori language. What the chiefs were wanting was rangatira, which essentially meant that they would maintain and exercise full authority or mana over the land and the resources on behalf of a wider community. This goes into play also because there's no such thing as land sale at that time for the Maoris. They had land ownership as tribal communities, not individual owners. So there were tribal differences and there were actually tribal warfare between tribes for control of territory, but not between individual people. So it wasn't as though you could sale a land from one person to another. It was the control of land from one tribe to another that was ever in dispute before. Well now, with British sovereignty, that meant that the crown had control over the land and even had eminent domain. So they were able to take land, they were able to make laws regarding land use, land sale, etc. That definitely affected how they ended up losing control of the majority of their lands. So unfortunately, after the treaty was signed, there were some fairly significant breaches. There was a New Zealand Settlement Act of 1863 where huge incentives for Europeans to come to New Zealand and settle and they were being given land. That land was being confiscated from the Māori. Furthermore, the Māori were such a minority at this point in time, they were being treated like second-class citizens, being usurped in the courts, and what they didn't know about European culture was being used against them. So whether that was language, practice, policy, or actual court judgments, they were losing their rights to their land. From the European perspective, there was a feeling that the treaty didn't advance European settlement, and so there was some conflict there. You had a number of settlers who were concerned that by dishonoring the treaty, they were dishonoring the crown. And so you did have people like William Martin, who wrote a book and wanted to say, hey, this is our reputation at stake and we need to do the right thing. But there was this clash that you had the crown in control and these Maori chiefs or kings who also wanted to have governorship of their particular lands. It was seen as treasonable to have these other leaders in charge because they were a challenge to British sovereignty. So conflict between the Crown and the Māori became almost inevitable. In 1860, there was a land transaction that was disputed and fighting broke out between the Māori and the British soldiers. 
So a conference was called, and over a three-week period, all of these kings, as well as British representatives, met and they talked through the entire treaty, and they revisited every part of the Treaty of Waitangi. And it was then realized, hold on, there are two completely different understandings of what this treaty means. So the Maori were, for the first time, realizing, oh, that isn't what we thought we signed. So at that time, there was a Kohima Rama ratification of the original treaty, and everybody, once again, even with this new understanding, agreed to the treaty. The Māori were thinking that the agreement to this ratification would get a greater part in decision-making. There had been promises made that there would be a conference like this every year to discuss the issues and talk about the problems and address them. That never happened. After decades of loss, in 1975, the Treaty of Watengi Act went into effect. It established a tribunal that would listen to grievances, make decisions, and actually assign reparations. It also gives recommendations on forthcoming legislation and can translate the treaty into past meaning and current effect, meaning it paves the way for a system of reparations. Since that was established, numerous claims have been made and numerous claims have been paid in different ways, through land, through financial restitution, and through the basic acknowledgement of wrongdoing. So in a recent decision, which assigned a tremendous amount of money and land back to the Ngati Maru tribe, Andrew Little, who was New Zealand's Minister of Health, and the Minister of the Treaty of Waitangi negotiations had this to say, for those actions which rendered your iwi almost completely landless, severed your connection to your wenua, which is land, and inflicted economic hardships and suffering on generations of your people, the Crown sincerely apologizes. He went on to say, the apology in and of itself cannot undo the harm that has been caused through the actions of the crown. But I hope that it demonstrates a different crown, one that seeks to learn from its history and commits to working alongside Nekatu Maru today and in the future. He actually read out all of the grievances that had been filed. And then he followed it with this, a list of the things that the crown was giving back. The financial redress of $30 million plus interest, the return of 16 sites of cultural significance, a fund of over a million dollars to aid with cultural revitalization, and giving the Nagati Maru the right to purchase the Tewera Crown Forest. And the minister finished with this understanding of why reparations were so important, not just to the iwi that were receiving reparations, but to the entire country. He says, once you lose your land, you lose your culture, you lose your language, you lose your identity, you lose everything. So we have been in a process of reclamation, rejuvenation, and revitalization. Okay, so there you got it. A little bit of history, and I hope that it helps you understand how these diverse cultures are all thriving in a single country. The nation is strong, they are progressive, and they have protected their natural beauty and are continuing to find ways to move ahead with these dual cultures that have come together to make this beautiful nation. So here's what we did in Waitangi. Can't stress enough that there's just lots of beauty here. We did a kayaking trip at Haruru Falls and it's wonderful. They will pick you up at the port, take you by van and get you your kayaks and get you suited up. You paddle up the river, you get to the waterfall, you can actually kayak under the waterfall, you can get out and swim. I had fun doing that. Uh, it's a great trip. It's not too strenuous. It's not too long and it's a fun time And if you've watched any of our other videos picked in in particular, you know I'm a kayaker and I love getting out there and getting to see the the world from that sea level And if you want to get on the water, but you don't want to do the work yourselves There are some really great Mori inspired canoe trips Well, they'll take you out on one of their traditional canoes and they'll take you on a warrior hunt and We had some friends that did that and really 
really enjoyed themselves and it was a great time. There are a number of small towns dotted throughout the Bay of Islands that are worth a visit. Starting with Opua, which is actually sort of the entrance to the Bay of Islands and is a perfect starting point for fishing trips and boat trips up through the bay. Paihe is a charming town with great beaches, lots of things to do, as well as a good museum for learning about the Bay of Islands. You can take a ferry over to Russell, which was once the capital of New Zealand and continues to be a historic town worth visiting. If you get up north to Kirikiri, you will find a vibrant arts area with a number of historical sites, including the Kirikiri Mission Station. And because the mission movement was so important to the development of New Zealand, it's worth seeing. Thanks so much for being with us in the Bay of Islands and thanks for sitting through the history lesson. But I hope you enjoyed that and we will miss New Zealand, but we're moving on to Indonesia. Please join us there. We have some amazing experiences to share.